So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our new webinar series, Smarter Together. Today's webinar is the second in this new series hosted by Georgia Tech Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation Group. My name is Greg McCormick. I'm the director of the Georgia Smart Communities Challenge, a grant program offered through the Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation Team. The grant's available to local governments in Georgia and provides funding and a research partnership with a Georgia Tech researcher to execute a year-long study or pilot project of smart community technology. Interested communities can visit our website or email us. Both are provided in the chat area today for your reference. Before we get started with today's webinar, a few housekeeping reminders. Please keep your audio and video muted throughout the presentation to limit interruptions. There will be an opportunity to ask the presenter questions at the end of the presentation. Please utilize the chat area to type your questions and you can submit those at any time. We are recording today's webinar and we'll make the recording and the slides available on our website in the media area of the events tab and that link is also made available in the chat area. So again, welcome to the Smarter Together webinar series and I'd now like to welcome Deborah Lamb, Managing Director of Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation, to welcome you and introduce today's presenter. Welcome Deborah. Thanks, Greg. Hello, everyone. My name is Deborah Lamb, um, and again, thank you for joining us at the Smarter Together webinar series. This is a new webinar series that really looks at a new stage of normal, um, looking at how inspirational research and innovation can really address um, some of these critical challenges affecting communities across the state and elsewhere. Um, this webinar topic is focused on rural transit in Georgia, and we're really lucky to have a, a very good powerhouse uh, duo and uh, panelists, our, our presenters and moderators. Um, we will have uh, Professor Donge and Professor Garo um, from Economics and Civil and Environmental Engineering give you a, a really in-depth uh, presentation. Vera McCartney and Paul Jero, who are members of the Georgia Regional Commission, um, talk about uh, you know, questions and issues that uh, are raised from the presentation, and obviously we'll take time to um, answer any questions that you have. As Greg talked about, um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type it on your chat box, um, and then we'll keep looking for any of those questions. But without further ado, um, I'll let our professors talk. Thank you. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, thanks Greg and Deborah for inviting me uh, to this webinar and I'm glad that my colleague and friend uh, Dr. Laurie Garrow is also going to join me today uh, to the webinar. Uh, before I get started, I'll also like to thank uh, GDOT for uh, funding this project and as we'll put a disclaimer at the end, uh, these are preliminary results, so make sure that uh, the main results will come out in the GDOT report. I'll also like to thank uh, my research assistant, Xiaoyu Dong, who helped me throughout this research. So without uh, much uh, further delay, I'm going to start with the presentation. I'm already sharing my slides with you. At any point, if you cannot see the slides, please let us know in the chat box and we'll try to fix it. So the topic uh, we chose was looking at the importance of investing in rural transit in Georgia. And that is mainly because we're reading so many news articles about uh, access to rural communities, uh, to medical centers, health facilities, uh, especially during these times that we thought this would be a topic of interest to our regional partners. If you look at transit in Georgia, it is varied and uh, most of us have used different modes of transportation. If you are in the metro area, you may have already used MARTA. If you are into uh, small urban or rural counties, you may have used some type of paratransit uh, vans. If you are into the coastal part, you may have already used or seen ferries, uh, carry passengers as well as cargo. Uh, you can think of freight trains, trains as well or regional commissions, buses, which connect MARTA stations to other modes. So looking at this varied transit land landscape, what we are going to focus today 
is on particular means which are going to be about the rural transit area. Georgia has a, if you look into this map of counties, we have almost uh, 159 counties in the state and there is a mix of rural and urban transit operators. So GDOT operates or is responsible for providing oversight for 80 rural transit systems and five uh, small urban operators. But if you look into this map, you'll see some of the white areas in the map, which are counties without any funding. And uh, we'll come and talk to this at the later part in the seminar that nearly 40 counties in uh, the state do not have any funding on transit. And that is a big gap that uh, our research aims to highlight uh, in our findings. We look into rural areas uh, which are defined by the FTA as uh, those serving communities with less than 50,000 uh, individuals or populations. Our uh, GDOT report is going to cover rural areas as well as small urban areas, but given our short time today, I'm going to focus just on the rural areas and we'll be looking uh, at 80 rural transit agencies that what we have covered in the study. Uh, most of these transit agencies, some of you may already know, provide demand responsive service only. And that is about uh, the services provided to about 114 counties or say 70% of all the counties in Georgia. So it's covering a majority of the state uh, transit demand. Two main sources of data were used for this study. We are looking at the National Transit Database. Uh, and this is a national database. We had to look for Georgia specific uh, variables. We use this data set mainly for looking at transit related variables like capital costs of transit, operating costs associated with rural transit, and what are the different service area service data, what are the number of miles per trip or the average miles per trip, what is the fair revenue and so on. Look at um, three years, which are the most recent ones available in this data. That is 2016, 2017, and 2018. And the reason for this, I'll show you in the next slide, is that there is a lot of variance in terms of costs. So we take average of these costs. Sometimes there is a capital expenditure uh, peak where counties are investing in capital uh, equipment and the next year there is not much capital expenditure. So we take a three year average and look at these costs uh, part. We also use the US Census Bureau and American Community Survey, survey is one of the largest census survey data available. We look at county level data from the survey, look at demographic uh, statistics, population characteristics, uh, population especially aged 16 or older is the one which uses most of the rural transit. We look into transportation and use statistics as well as commute statistics from the census part. I'm going to more focus today on the economic costs and the economic benefits, giving you just a snapshot of the analysis that we did. And then Dr. Garrow is going to join me and she's going to talk more about the rural transit service and the gaps have currently that are seen in to the service provision. So if we come to the transit costs, we are looking at two types of costs largely, the operating costs as well as the capital costs. Most of you would know the operating costs are mostly incurred daily on daily expenditure like cost of labor. You're looking at fringe benefits, administrative costs, maintenance, equipment, and so on. Uh, typically, these costs for rural transit, and I'm giving you average amounts just remember through these three years, were about 30 to 32 million dollars per year. If we look into the capital costs, these are now more acquired towards uh, long term properties and leases on physical assets such as buses, garages, and maintenance facilities. Capital costs were much smaller, about one sixth of the operating costs, amounting to about $5 million per year. We can also look at the transit costs by sources of funding, and I'm just giving you a quick picture of that, that uh, there are different uh, 
federal and state and local programs which will provide funding for uh, transit agencies. If we see most of the operating costs, say about 43% of the operating costs were covered by the federal programs, nearly 40% were also covered by local programs. So those were the two main sources of funding for rural transit. If we look into capital costs on the other side, most of the funding, nearly 80% was coming from the federal funds and local or state level funds were contributing about 10% respectively. So you can see where uh, funding comes from different programs um, and there are different programs listed on FTA which uh, provide this type of funding for rural transit areas. Uh, to estimate the transit benefits, we follow an economic impact analysis model and some of you may be familiar with this model. I'll just go into some parts of the or the main structure of the, this model and the report uh, which will come out will have more details on the model. When we are looking at economic benefits, we look at four or five main variables. The first variable is looking at the total output or what is the total production which has increased because of some economic activity. In our case, this is going to be expenditure on rural transit. What is the value added in the production? So you're looking at not just the total, but how much did we add in terms of productivity? What was the gain in produ productivity in the economy? We are of course looking at employment and how many jobs were created by this type of expenditure. We are looking at tax income or tax revenues which uh, are accrued by the federal as well as state and local governments. And all of these together will come under the benefits or the economic benefits umbrella. If we have to think of how are these benefits getting generated, then we are looking at three different effects. We are looking into the direct effects, that is uh, whenever uh, an agency has some initial spending that is incurred, what is the direct impact of that on the economy? That would be the direct impact or the direct effect. Indirect effects as well as induced effects are what we call as the ripple effects and these are mainly the multiplier effects if you have heard this term in uh, different contexts. These are coming from the direct effect in an indirect way that uh, I'll take an example in a bit, but you're looking at the initial spending creating demand into industries further down the supply chain and the induced effects are where consumers are getting additional income and then spending that additional income into uh, activities which trigger further economic benefits. So let's take an example so that uh, a concrete example that uh, will help you just see what do we mean by these different types of effects. If uh, a transit agency, a rural transit agency is planning to spend money by purchasing a bus or a van, a paratransit uh, mode of transport, then the direct impact is of course going to be the expense the agency incurs in purchasing of the bus and the income it generates uh, to the workers who are working in production of the bus, right? That would be the direct impact. As a result of this impact, there is going to be a ripple effect and you're going to see that production of raw materials, screws and bolts and parts and uh, mechanical uh, parts which go into the bus. Uh, manufacturing will also get a boost and there will be more income generated into industries linked to this particular manufacturing activity. That's going to be the indirect effect. The induced effect is when we look at all the different type of labor income that is being generated and where are people spending that type of money. So when they are working in bus manufacturing uh, depots, when they are looking into uh, tire factories and paint factories, these workers are ultimately going to spend the additional income that they have generated and that is going to be spent on consumer durables, most likely eating out restaurants, they are going to the shops, they are going to purchase different goods and products. All of that generates further economic activity. That is what we call as the induced effect. So for any fruitful investment, what we are interested is less in the direct effect but more into this multiplier effect. What is the multiplier effect in terms of the indirect impact as well as the induced impact? I'll show you a few numbers now. We are going to calculate these numbers. 
using our model, I'm giving you just some features of the model. We are looking at statewide impact. So the agencies are spread out. We are covering nearly 70% of the county. So it makes sense to look at the statewide impact rather than just a focused local impact. Though we can, of course, um, calculate the focused local impact by the county as well. But I'll present the results on the statewide impact. We are going to be looking into different impacts. So uh, in the project, we look into impact the cause of operating costs, impact separately the cause of capital costs. Today, I'll show you both and then add it together. We are looking into rural as well as small urban transit. Um, small urban transit definitely has much more uh, expense than rural transit, so it has a greater impact because it's serving a much larger population size. We are going to be looking into operating costs as well as capital costs. Um, typically in this literature, what but uh, we assume is that most of the operating costs that these transit agencies incur are spent within the economy, right? You are hiring workers uh, who are daily serving as drivers, uh, bus conductors. These are going to be circulating within the economy. The capital costs are the tricky ones because uh, not all of the capital costs incurred on equipment, on acquisition uh, are going to be spent inside the state. So there are different assumptions typically made on capital costs. Uh, what I'll show you today is a standard assumption of looking at most of the operating costs, that is 90% of the operating costs spent inside the state and 50% uh, of the capital costs spent within the state. Uh, we look at different scenarios. What happens when we assume all of the capital costs are going to be spent inside the state? Of course, the benefits will be improved. If we reduce the percentage and say only one quarter of the capital cost is spent within the state, then we are going to get a much smaller impact. Let's look into some numbers for you to get an idea. So let's look at the economic benefit. Now I'm showing you the picture uh, or the table with both uh, operating and capital costs, remember 90% of operating costs and 50% of capital costs are spent within the state. We look at the total economic impact and we see that about $64 million of the total effect was produced in terms of the output. So I'm looking at the top table and the very last column, I'm looking at the output there and I'm looking at what was the total effect. You can see the direct effect was small. That's about $2.8 million. That was what was spent. As a result of that, the indirect effect, what we talked earlier, was generated of about $45 million and an induced impact in terms of additional income being spent in the economy. That impact was about $16 million. So total impact of $64 million was generated out of this uh, transit expenditure. If you look into labor income or the additional income that was generated, we get about $23 million there. Uh, where is this labor income coming from? We can look into the first column, which is looking at employment or the number of jobs that were created. There were a large number of jobs as a result of the direct effect, which is about, say, 75 new jobs. But the interesting fact here is the indirect and induced impacts, right? That there is a lot of uh, activity or job creation because of this direct um, investment or expenditure on rural transit that we see an indirect effect and induced effect and a total of more than 900 jobs being spent, uh, created because of annually because of the rural transit expenditure. If we look into the fiscal impact, uh, we see that um, about $4 million um, dollars were generated in terms of federal taxes. Most of the federal taxes, if you see into the columns, come from employee compensation or the tax on employees' income. Most of the state and local taxes come, on the other hand, from the sales tax or the tax on production and imports. And we found or we estimate about $2 million uh, dollars were generated in state and local tax revenues. If you look at what are the type of sectors where these jobs were created, remember this is all simulation, right? So what we are doing is we are looking into the local data. We are looking into the type of uh, industrial activity, the type of manufacturing sectors, type of industries and firms and retails 
businesses available in those areas and then using the multipliers when we are saying what happens when one dollar is invested how is it triggering the economy right so what we are getting uh, in our simulations is that we are looking at employment largely into of course the transit and ground transportation sector but you can see very different type of uh, sectors also creating uh, some employment in which are related to the transit or transportation sector insurance agencies for instance uh, building services real estate we are looking into uh, wholesale trade or even uh, restaurants where consumers are now spending more and as a result you are getting additional job creation if we look into the different scenarios as i mentioned earlier you can always since this is a model you can always change the variables and see how the scenarios change how are the economic benefits changing and of course uh, the more you spend within the state the benefits are going to improve we are going to get a higher total impact this is looking at the capital costs only so you are getting a total impact of 10 million dollars or more if you spend very less in the state uh, and that is the case then you are going to get about 3 million the problem with the NTD data that we use is that we get data in terms of where is the data getting funded or what is the source of the data we do not know where were the costs spent in terms of purchases and that's why we have to assume these different scenarios and then say whether the capital costs were incurred largely within states or outside the states and how are the estimates going to change um, just to summarize the different economic benefits, you're looking at a total of about $31 million were spent and on average we get a $64 million uh, benefit uh, in terms of increase in the output. Thus, if we look at a cost-benefit ratio, we get uh, $1 spent on rural transit translates to about $2 um, in economic benefits. And we did an extensive research on what are the benefits in other states and other studies and our estimate fits right into that range where you are getting anywhere between a dollar invested leads to 14 cents to a dollar invested leads to about three dollars. So we are feeling more confident about our model and seeing that uh, that is the amount of uh, expenditure or investment uh, two dollars a dollar invested is leading to a $2 economic benefit. In terms of job creation, we saw that nearly 900 new jobs are getting created annually. A large majority, of course, are going to be into the transportation sector, but uh, also in other related sectors. So many of the jobs are getting created because of the multiplier effect of rural transit. A dollar spent on rural transit is leading to, say, 22 cents in terms of returns, in terms of tax revenue. And both state and local agencies, as well as the federal agencies, are able to garner this additional output in terms of taxes. So overall, we do conclude that this is a investment which is bringing a lot of benefit to the state and the economy and that is it is important just looking at this very narrow focus of what is the economic cost and what is the benefit that we need to continue investing in rural transit i'm going to hand over now to my colleague uh, dr carol who is going to talk about other benefits of rural transit and why they are important laurie yes just confirming shatasha you can hear me yes i can Okay, perfect. So yes, if you could advance the next slide. Okay, so I want to return back to um, one of the first slides that we showed when we kicked off the presentation, which was looking at transit in the state of Georgia. So currently, we do have many counties in white that elect not to draw down um, the funding that they receive from the federal government to support transit systems. So about 23% uh, or one in four counties in Georgia currently does not have service. The majority of these counties are focused on uh, rural counties or those that are lower population, lower density. But we do have some areas near Atlanta, such as Rockdale and Newton, um, Fayette, that would fall into sort of a mix of rural and urban counties. Next slide. 
So the question that we wanted to look at is, let's look at what our current rural transit systems are doing in Georgia and do a high-level assessment of where transit investments may be needed. One of the things about our rural transit systems is that for each of the counties shown, um, about half of the counties currently offering rural transit service operate three or fewer vehicles. Um, so many of the systems are very small. They also tend to run limited hours. What do I mean by that? Of about the approximately 80 rural transit systems we have, only five of them are offering 24-hour service on weekdays, Monday through Friday. Um, many of them, almost 50%, start at 8 a.m. or later. Uh, they will also tend to end service earlier in the day. 33% are ending service before 5 p.m. Um, and what this means is that um, if you think about offering service effectively, let's say between 9 or 3 or 9 and 4, you're only really going to be able to serve certain types of trips or certain types of trip purposes. Next slide. So when we do an analysis based on a sample of actual trip data or actual routing data, um, we see that a large proportion of the trips currently being served in the rural communities are for medical purposes. Shopping pops up as the second uh, most frequent trip purpose. This can include trips to the grocery store as well as, let's say, to CVS to pick up prescriptions. Employment is a relatively small percentage at 12%. Um, and we have a variety of other types of trip purposes. I'm only showing the most um, frequent trips here based on our sample. But you do see that rural transit is serving a large variety of purposes, including behavioral health, um, adult daycare, dialysis, um, a little bit of child care. Ones that did not make the list, for instance, include job training. So the question becomes, um, can we compare those systems that are offering, let's say, 24-hour service uh, and the mix of trips that they're doing to see if you know, we can enhance or if we're missing anything is one thing. Just thinking about it broadly, for instance, if you're only running service from 9 to 3, you're probably not going to be catching um, or helping support a lot of the employment trips that may be needed. Um, you may not be able to do a lot of the job training or educational types of trips. So one of the things that's commonly done in the literature is um, – to expand out the service, to say, okay, well, what would be the investment priority, for instance, or how much would it cost, what would be the benefits if we extended the hours of service and or the days of service that it's offered? Okay, next slide. So we ran um, one scenario. Um, what we wanted to do was to extend service in those counties that currently had rural transit service and or initiate start service in those counties um, with rural populations that didn't have it, and set up a baseline of service that basically ran from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., Monday through Saturday. Um, so not just Monday through Friday, but also capturing Saturday. Currently, I believe we only have five or six systems um, in the state that offer service on Saturday, to put that in perspective. Uh, then what we did is we used data on our existing rural transit trips to estimate um, the increase in ridership, the operating costs, and capital costs, really focusing in on those systems that offer 24-hour service and Saturday service. So sorry, six offer Saturday service, five or 24 hours, and one runs about a 12-hour service. Okay, next slide. So when we did this, um, one of the sort of, I guess, interesting results um, the bottom line is that um, we're estimating about four in 10 rural transit trips are currently not being served, that we just don't have the capacity or the funding um, to do this. The majority of these are in you know, the low population, low density counties. So for me, the biggest numbers here are the ridership gains um, for the row initiating service in counties without service. Ridership gains we had estimated at 276,000. To put that in perspective, um, our fiscal year 18 ridership levels were about 664,000. So um, again, a large proportion, I would argue, of trips are being unserved. We can then estimate um, you know, the operating costs, the number of additional vehicles that are needed, 
And what's interesting is that let's say for maybe a 25 to 30% investment, we can see substantial gains, almost a, let's say a 62% increase in the ridership level. So this is in some ways somewhat encouraging, but it leads us back to the question of, all right, but what's going on in rural Georgia? Why are some of the counties basically electing not to offer rural transit service? So next slide. So one of the things that we did in a separate project is we looked at the amount of money that the federal government through the um, 5311 program uh, was providing to each one of the counties and did a comparison between the, let's say, county decision to offer service or not. And for me, what's very clear on the last column is that um, the less money you get, the smaller, in other words, number of population you have, the less likely you are to take that step of initiating rural transit service. So for instance, if you are a county that has a population of 50K or below, 60% um, of those counties are currently not providing rural service, as opposed to if you're a county serving more than uh, 300,000, um, only 15% are basically electing not to offer rural transit systems. So when you look at the map at Georgia on the right, one of the um, indications that becomes clear, especially if you think about the um, southeastern part of the state, that swash of, let's say, light gray, um, not around Atlanta, but sort of in the middle of the state, instead of counties acting individually to operate service, maybe there's opportunities for uh, forming more county level, multi-county level types of relationships. So looking at combining service, for instance, across, you know, Coffee, Irwin, Appling counties um, to pool together. So in other words, looking at economies of scale that may kick in if you're able to do more of a regionalized system. And we do have some of those regional systems, four or five, uh, in Georgia right now. Southwest Georgia is an example of a regional system that is working very well. Coastal Regional Commission near Savannah is another very large regional system that tends to be working well. Okay, next slide. So the motivation for this project is that this was funded in collaboration with, or sort of at the same time, that the Georgia Department of Transportation was undergoing, um, I think it's first, if not its uh, largest revamp of a statewide transit plan. So um, over the past 18 months, AECOM um, has been working very closely with GDOT to put together a statewide transit plan to look at more detailed information on where our investment priorities should be. So clearly doing analysis just on you know, current routing information, um, I like to view it analysis in a box, right, where you're only looking at data, isn't going to get to the same level of detail or same conclusions as if you're able to go out and interview stakeholders, um, talk to the counties to see what they need, what are some of the barriers of offering transit, et cetera. So in terms of timing, um, I guess I'm delighted, right, to tell you guys that the final report on the statewide transit plan, the draft, uh, was just released about a week or two ago, and we are in the comment period for GDOT. So I wanted to make sure I provided the links for everyone to be able to review the draft statewide transit plan that's available. And um, again, there's a link if you have any comments to be added to this draft plan before it becomes finalized. The next slide. So that concludes our presentation. And I do want to thank um, the Department of Transportation, GDOT, for supporting our research. And normal disclaimers, of course, apply. Next slide. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Jared to kick off with um, some questions. Jared, you may need to unmute your phone, which is the little mute button on the up top part that says unmute phone, the little microphone.
why don't I start with the first question and then I'll, I'll let Paul and Jared um, uh, facilitate the question. Um, so this is really interesting. What, what caught me was actually the job creation that could happen with expanded rural transit, especially given the, the current condition we, we face ourselves, we, we are in, in terms of limited um, public transit and of course, um, limited economic um, opportunities. So can you tell us a little bit more about how this could support and, and essentially create win-win opportunities in both uh, providing more rural transit, but also providing more um, jobs for Georgia? Um, thanks, Deb. Sure, I'll be uh, delighted to talk a bit more about that. Uh, what happens is whenever we have any kind of uh, I'm going back to the slide so that we can have those numbers in front of us. Any kind of um, economic investment happening in the economy, what happens is there is, of course, a direct effect. As you see, uh, our model thought uh, looked at it and we found that about 75 jobs, new jobs were created in the local transportation sector. But what is more important is the indirect and the induced effect. And that is sometimes which is usually missed when we are talking about uh, just the direct impact is that when there are uh, people who are getting additional money and these small firms which are providing say uh, services for transportation, uh, looking at insurance agencies and consulting firms which are giving providing contractors to the transit agencies. They are as well uh, as the direct impact, they are also getting an indirect impact of this investment. And as a result, you see that in the indirect effects, in, in fact, we found that more than 700, so that's 10 times the direct impact, right? That the jobs are getting created and the induced impacts are where uh, we are seeing the income effect of the entire activity, that there is an additional income created, which leads to further uh, spending in terms of consumers and then further jobs are created because of that. If we look at this, and I'm just showing you a small list, but we can always go into the details. But what happens is when we look at these numbers, and these are, again, predictions, right, uh, from the model. But the model is using uh, or making these predictions based on what is the employment mix in the economy. So if I did this model with numbers from a neighboring state, say Florida, the sectors where the jobs are getting created may differ because that depends on what is the local economics uh, or the local economic structure in that particular state. But we do see that the indirect impact is seeing a, a large impact in terms of all the related activities which are coming from this ripple effect. And that is, I think, uh, as you pointed uh, earlier, that given our current economic situation, that is something very important to keep in mind as we, of course, start budgeting and making these cuts into uh, different uh, funding parts, that it's going to have a uh, impact in terms of job loss when you stop this type of uh, transit fund funding as well. Interesting. Um, just a quick note that for those that want to ask a question, um, please type it in the chat box on your right hand column um, and we'll, we'll kind of take those questions as we go. But let me turn this back to uh, Jared and Paul to see if uh, they have more questions. Uh, this is Jared. Are you able to hear me okay now? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, had a little technical difficulty there. Uh, I was just um, going to uh, note and then ask. Uh, oh, I think Jared's having some technical difficulties still. Um, Paul, do you want to ask the question? 
Yeah, I'll, I've got one on, that I was thinking of. Um, for the speakers, I was wondering if the lack of transit in those counties that do not have any transit at all, I wonder if that is related to the lack of uh, industry or jobs there. Um, cause it, looks, it looks like that they are located right next to counties that have a lot of jobs. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if the need is just so low that, that, that the cost of having a service there just, just not make any sense. I think you kind of gleaned on that just a little bit in your presentation. Yeah, so this is Lori. So the statewide um, plan that GDOT just released went into detail, more detail on that through interviews and um, may have some additional insights. But yes, the relatively, you know, low density and low number of people is definitely, I think, influencing the lack of transit in those part of the states. However, if you think about the need for transit, however, you do have trends that we have an aging population. Those individuals need medical care. Often dialysis is a major component of medical care because that is two or three times a week that you need um, dialysis and you know, to go to the facilities. So one of the things, for instance, that we see in Southwest Georgia that is similar is um, I don't, I don't want to call them hospital shuttles, but there is a provision of on-demand transit that really is crossing counties to get to medical care. We do have some of our Georgia residents in these counties, for instance, that are using rural transit to cross state lines. So going into Florida, going into neighboring states to receive the medical care they need because those are the closest facilities. So even though we don't currently have transit, let's say, in that part of the state, uh, just based on a comparison of what's happening in other parts of the state that may have similar populations, similar, let's say, age or demographic profiles, um, it's hard to imagine that we don't have, at least on some as aspects, the medical needs that need to be served or, should, or that we would like to serve. Yes. Um, and I wonder if... The counties, like you, as you said, a lot of the hospital systems may offer a shuttle, but I wonder if the counties next to these large or more, more popular populated counties, would they be able to partner with the neighboring counties that do offer a service, to, you know, for those top tier services that would be needed? I wonder if they would be able to partner for, um, you know, those, those most needed services with the direct transit systems neighboring them. Yes, and that is a suggestion that we also recommended in our final report to look at the possibility of regionalized systems. And I believe that is also one of the proposed solutions um, that is in the statewide transit plan as well. Doing individual systems, you know, Georgia holds the distinction right now <laughs> of being mm -hmm. the state in the nation that has the most um, individual rural transit systems. So as of last fiscal year, we were at 80 systems. That means GDOT has to write 80 separate contracts, um, you know, monitor 80 individual systems, report data for 80 individual systems. That's the most of any nation. Um, other states like Texas have some as well. Being on the East Coast, our counties tend to be small than on the West Coast. So there is some just sort of distinctions in what is a county across the nation. But if you look at the fact that we are the state um, that has the current, the most, you know, individual transit systems on the rural side, combined with the fact that we've got many counties, 25%, that aren't providing transit, I think the regionalized solution, as you're proposing it, is one um, that definitely merits additional attention. It does make sense that we have that many systems because we're one of the states that has one of the most counties for its land area as well. <laughs> Um, we did receive some questions in the chat. Uh, the first one being, have you considered in the model the effect of social distancing requirements on ridership, which may be with us for some time? In London, for example, ridership is being limited to between 15 and 20 percent of capacity for the foreseeable future. 
Anyone want to tackle that one? Yeah, Shatakshi, do you mind if I offer a first opinion on this and then you can chime in? Sure, go ahead. So with rural transit, it is important to remember that this is a um, on-demand service already, meaning that individuals normally need to pre-schedule their trip um, one to three days in advance. So unlike you know, a taxi or a ride share or public transit where everybody shows up, there's calling into a reservation system to effectively make the ride. Um, the other thing is like with other aspects, we may see some peaking in the rides. What do I mean by that? The dialysis patients is a good example. Everyone may need to start dialysis at the same time, eight o'clock or like noon, um, if that makes sense. But for the most part on the social distancing, um, the vehicle sizes may currently, let's say, have, um, you know, run, let's say, capacity of eight to 12. They are usually handicap accessible, although we do have fleet that are not handicap accessible. Um, and so the question becomes, while we do have social distancing and, um, you know, in play, my sense is that and I don't want to call it the need for social distancing, but the load factors, right? The number of people that are actually on the paratransit vehicles at any given point in time has two things working for it. One is we can control the people on board because we're doing scheduling, right? So look if we can reschedule or move some people around to maintain that. And then the second is they're pretty small to begin with, um, the, the vehicles, um, and there may just be certain periods of the day where we're running into capacity issues. I'm going to guess probably the morning, um, the employment, and or, you know, those things that have a fixed timeline. So the, the, that was not taken account of in the analysis. This was done before um, COVID kicked in. But I do think the rural transit, just by its nature, is a different type of solution than what we would be looking at in an urban situation. Um, right, thank you. Yeah, I think you added uh, almost uh, everything that I had to say. Only thing uh, I would point out is that, remember, there are two different types of services. One is the demand response service, and that's what uh, Laurie was mentioning earlier, is you can schedule then that uh, the service is provided once people call and say they need a transit uh, bus from point A to point B. And most of the rural uh, transit agencies are providing right now in Georgia only demand response services. The other one is a fixed bus route, and that is where you will need to take care more uh, of this uh, new reality where you are thinking about how do we social distance, where the routes are decided and the buses are operating regardless of the number of people uh, coming in and out and they are applying. That is mostly happening into the small urban as well as the urban transit areas. The next observation was um, the benefits due to capital investment. Um, this question is regarding, is that effect short term? Is that, uh, Paul, can you just repeat the last part? Yes. Um, the question is, uh, you highlight the benefits due to capital investment. Okay. Um, initially, is that a short-term investment? Is that a short-term benefit? Yes. Uh, that's a great question. Um, the numbers that we are projecting right now are short term in the sense they are looking at a one year turnover. So we are definitely looking at benefits coming from, for instance, here in terms of capital costs within a year. But you are absolutely right that these are going to be much uh, more uh, persistent, especially because these are capital costs, right, that they are investing in capital equipment, which is going to be much uh, persistent in the long run versus the short run expenditures in terms of operating costs. What we are doing here in terms of benefits is annual benefits, uh, and we are just showing it for one year, and these would uh, get generated the year when this capital expenditure was incurred. Okay. Uh, Jared's got a question that he posted in the comments. 
the pie graph show exactly what I would expect the financial breakout to be for public transit systems using purchase of service trips like Medicaid and DHS. Our latter slides like the state map of transit funding showing just public transportation as opposed to Medicaid systems and DHS systems. Laurie, do you want to take this one? I do. Can you repeat the last part of the question? Sure. Um, are the latter slides like the state map of transit funding showing just public transportation as opposed to Medicaid systems and DHS? So is it? Understood. Okay, Thanks. I'm good now. Okay. Um, yeah, so currently it's a mix, uh, meaning that this portrait is created through data that goes to the National Transit Database um, from GDOT. So what that means is that the county must be receiving 5311 FTA funds. So this is from the Federal Transit Association. So it's basically, if you're on this map, and you're blue or green or yellow, you are receiving uh, funds from the Federal Transit Association. If you are white, it is possible that that county may be contracting directly with DHS to look at um, other purchase of service transportation, um, in which case they are not required to coordinate with GDOT since they're not getting FTA funds. So the way to view this is this is funding from FTA. Um, some of the blue ones, some of the yellow ones, some of the green ones may have both um, you know, DHS funds as well as FTA that are running or being tracked through GDOT. Um, but we cannot make a determination based on the data source if the white includes um, DHS run or other types of purchase of service agreements. We just know, if the way to view it is, we just know they're not using their FTA um, 5311 funds or their rural transit funds. Thank you. Jared made a comment about um, the importance of rural transit on recruiting new industry. Um, he says this is important given the number of households without a vehicle in rural areas. Just a comment there. Uh, Caleb has a question for the panelists. Considering a large portion of trips are used for medical, shopping, and social slash recreation, can you explain how that factored into the 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Saturday decision? Specifically, why the 4 p.m. cutoff and why not Sunday? If I remember correctly, and I apologize, my recollection on this is not 100%. Um, there are design guidelines to come up with level of service, uh, which is like a criteria for roadways, um, rural transit, et cetera. And the hours that we looked at that I believe were the 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. on the Monday through Saturday were recommended or grounded in uh, these design guidelines for the level of service. So it was subjective, if that makes sense, but it was based on sort of guidelines, if that makes sense, or that determine what, you know, based on other studies, what a quote unquote minimum level of service should be. Um, we call that a baseline uh, level of service. So again, I have to go back and look at what the specific definitions were, but we did base it, if that makes sense, on design guidelines related to level of service for transit systems and rural transit systems in particular. Thank you. Chris has a question. The $5 million in capital costs mentioned earlier, was this before or after the federal slash state subsidy? So was this before or after, uh, Paul? What was that? That's the total, I think, Shatakshi. So uh, given the breakout, we had federal, state, and local. The five million would be the total that was spent. So the majority of that capital is capturing paratransit vehicle purchases. There is also some uh, small capital in that, such as tablet purchases, cameras for um, equipment, like vehicles, that kind of thing. But um, Shatashi, I believe the five million is total 
in particular, the way to verify that is on the capital cost. If this chart was based on the yes. $5 million, yeah, we, we typically yes. have a 80-10-10 split, if that makes sense. 80% can come from federal, 10% local, 10% state. So it would include everything. Right, yeah. Thank you, everyone. It seems like we had some, some pretty good technical questions um, for our professors. And, and thank you, Jared and Paul, for um, moderating this session. Um, there's obviously so much more to discuss about rural transit, but its importance to Georgia is, is, is clearly known. Um, and, and there's going to be, a, hopefully, a lot more activity um, in, in the coming weeks. Um, as Laurie suggested, there, there is a public participation um, survey that's out there. So I, I encourage you all to, to share your insight um, as, as that will be a critical part to um, thinking about the next stage of rural transit in Georgia. Um, again, thank you everyone. Um, this is our Smarter Together webinar series. Um, tune in for with us next Thursday at noon where we'll be talking about real estate um, and economic development in a post-COVID-19 world. Um, thank you again. Thank you everyone for all the comments. We really appreciate uh, your interest in this. Thanks Deb for organizing this.